Hello, friend. Thanks for joining me for another book chat. Today, let's spend a few minutes with Kindred Neanderthal, Life, Love, Death, and Art by Rebecca Rag Sykes. This is a work of nonfiction and was originally published in 2020. It caught my attention because of this theme of the Neanderthals. I've always been really into prehistory. The author mentions here that her interest in prehistory was sort of kicked off at a young age by reading the Clan of the Cave Bear series. It's called the Earth's Children series by Jean Owl. And I read these as well back in the early 90s. And I wonder if that's what sort of fed my interest in, has fed my interest in prehistory ever since. The author here mentions, though, that in those books, they were criticized at the time because of their portrayal of the Neanderthals. But subsequent research over the last 30 years has really borne out a lot of, of that uh, sort of depiction, that fictionalized depiction that is in that series. I think I read three. I think there's six maybe total in that series. I think I might have only read the first three of that. But anyway, very good series um, I enjoyed back in the day. But to Kindred, um, you know, this is a really difficult book to chat, I think. I'm not an authority on Neanderthals or on prehistory, so I certainly couldn't teach this book. So I thought how I would approach this chat would be just to go through some of the points that I took away, that uh, sort of sort of the impressions that I took that, that uh, really were the most interesting to me. So let's just dive into that. Um, the first sort of thing I wanted to discuss here is archaeological time. And the author makes a really good... Um, has a really good explanation of this, sort of helps us to feel the immensity of the time that we're talking about, because we really only have a memory, you know, generally we only think of our, we might have a memory of our grandparents, but our great-grandparents, you know, it starts to get dimmer and dimmer, and then by the time we just get a few generations back, those people are generally lost to us, really, to history, you know, to us, to our own personal histories. But then we're talking about thousands of generations back uh, to get to the era of the Neanderthals. She makes a point here in the book about the caves of Lascaux and the caves of Chauvet. And so the cave of, of Lascaux, the cave of Lascaux here, this, was, this artwork was not done by Neanderthals. It was actually done by our species, Homo sapiens, in a, it was about 15,000 to 17,000 years ago. This artwork is closer in time to the, to the photos on your iPhone than this art from the cave of Chauvet. So the cave of Chauvet, also done by our ancestors, not by Neanderthals, but by the Homo sapiens, but nevertheless about 33,000 years ago. And so this is the time we're talking about, this immensity of time. But the cave of the, the this artwork in the caves of Lascaux from 15 to 17,000 years ago, you would have to repeat that twice and more than twice over in time to get to the time of the last of the Neanderthals. So I just thought that was really um, cool and put that into, into perspective. The Neanderthals first appeared in the, um, as sort of a distinct species from the book here about 400,000 to 450,000 years ago. And, um, you know, they, um, they existed then for until about 40,000 years ago. So our, um, our Homo sapiens and the Neanderthals, we did cross paths, and I'm going to talk more about that here in a bit. But the Neanderthals, the first of the Neanderthals, the Come to find out, we've actually found their bones before, but no one understood what they were. But the first time that it sort of, they were identified as actually a different kind of human was in 1856. It was discovered, the first, uh, this skeleton was discovered in the Neander Valley in Germany. And I thought this was really cool, talked about in the book here about the Neander Valley. The Neander Valley is named for a German composer by the name of Joachim uh, Neander. And his his original name had been Joachim Newman, but he had changed it to Neander to sort of fit the times, um, sort of a fad at the time. But in any case, Newman means new man. Neander means new man. And they found this new man in the Neander Valley. I thought that was so cool. Um, yeah, in 1856. But they really didn't know what to make of it, the scientists of the time, because this really, finding this 
sort of different species of human really clashed with the worldview of Europeans at the time. And so they didn't really know what to make of it. So they misinterpreted it a lot as far as like creating this, uh, this is sort of where we get the caveman um, myth of this sort of brutish, um, dull, you know, not very intelligent, uh, violent sort of being. Um, and, you know, as far as like being racially inferior to Homo sapiens, to our species, because the scientists at the time wanted, of course, us, considered us to be the pinnacle of evolution, because namely, we continued to exist, whereas they ultimately went extinct. But, you know, the reasons for that aren't really known. Why they went extinct, um, that's something that scholarship and academic, academics are still trying to uncover. But um, these sort of misperceptions about Neanderthals have continued really to this day, more or less. Now, we were different. We were a different species, but we could interbreed. More about that in a minute. But we could interbreed, but we, we were different species. And here is a graphic that I pulled that um, shows sort of the difference in the skeleton. You can tell that the Neanderthal skeleton is shorter, stockier build, had a different kind of head. The cranium was shaped a little bit different, had kind of this more of a sloping forehead and these really uh, pronounced brow ridges and, you know, different sort of physiology going on, different sort of anatomy. But we had... So studies have shown that they could they could probably speak like us. Uh, I mean, we don't know how they spoke, obviously, but they had the ability to speak, uh, according to this book. Also, the ability to hear, um, sort of similar to we to our ability to hear. They probably had a better sense of smell than we do, and may, perhaps a different sense of a different type of eyesight than we do slightly. But um, Overall, this is what uh, this is sort of a representation based on the skeletons of what a Neanderthal might have looked like compared to us. You can kind of tell the difference in the head shape here in this uh, this sort of graphic that I that I found. Um, but yeah, so I mentioned they disappeared from the archaeological record about forty thousand years ago. Um, but they didn't they didn't they didn't cease to exist completely because they are in our current they are in our DNA they are in my DNA. Um, I did uh, my DNA through twenty three and Me uh, DNA analysis that gives you all sorts of information about you know your your genetics and part of the part of that is a report about the amount of Neanderthal variants in in you know my DNA and so I have um Less than two percent of my DNA is Neanderthal, but I had um, I have more ne more Neanderthal DNA than forty three percent of the other others who have had this uh, this test done. So Neanderthal uh, DNA genetics is in my very uh, body even as we speak. Many people around the world do have Neanderthal D DNA. It really depends on where your genetics originates. I believe so Sub-Saharan Africans don't have DNA uh, Neanderthal DNA to speak of. Um, and there's some other groups. I think Native Americans uh, perhaps don't. I don't really remember all the details of who who do not have it. But if if you're from uh, Asia, uh, Western Asia, from about the borders of China, Neanderthals live from what we know right now, according to this book, from about uh, the British Isles, like Wales and England, all the way to the western border of China. And then there was another species uh, over there in the, kind of the western border of China called the Denisovans, who also entered interbred with the um, with the Neanderthals and they can they share a common ancestor I think that we don't share I'm not sure I don't remember that detail exactly but very cool uh, when it comes to that um, so you know the Neanderthals weren't the dumb brutes that that the history has portrayed them to be. Scholarship has shown that very clearly now. They had a very robust culture. The book spends a lot of time talking about the different aspects, specifically around tools, the stone tools they use, how they were made, the technology of them, and also how they hunted. These were hunters and gatherers. Um, obviously, they didn't have metal, so everything had to be out of made out of stone or wood. They also, there's evidence that they used wood for various uh, tasks. But the thing that struck me here was that the Neanderthals actually had 
had to have a pretty sophisticated um, method to pass down information because they understood raw stones. They understood st the qualities of stones, what stones made what type of tools, what bone made what type of tools, and what the quality of the stone was with, that they happened to come across. Where they, they also knew where good locations of good stone were was. And they also knew where to go in certain times, like if animals were migrating, where to meet them, where to go ahead of time to be there when the animals got there so that they could have a successful hunt. And so that is a pretty sophisticated uh, batch of knowledge that is getting passed down from a parent to, to child, because that's the only way that this kind of information obviously could be passed down. So to me, that right there says that they had a pretty sophisticated system of knowledge that they were able to pass on to their children. Um, then they talk about um, uh, burials. Um, there's a, there's a, a, a small child, an infant really, that died, and the underthal baby that died. And the author makes this really beautiful sort of point about how the mother must have left this baby, uh, you know, that had not survived behind in this rock ledge where they were staying, and then had bar more or less buried it so that it wouldn't get disturbed. And it didn't get disturbed um, for, this, for this huge amount of time. There is a picture here that I'll just share that shows a, a little graphic of that baby uh, underneath that house that existed there. This little baby Neanderthal uh, after thousands and thousands of years. So cool. Um, they had, they had uh, you know, about... They didn't bury uh, their dead the way we think of today. And even early Homo sapiens didn't really bury... They didn't get sophisticated burials until a little, you know, till later. But... Um, there was some ritual processing of the dead among Neanderthals. I think this also happened among early Homo sapiens, meaning they, they kind of cut up a, a body and maybe even ate part of it um, as part of maybe a death ritual. I thought that was really strange. And also very kind of cool. If you study kind of prehistory, you know that early Homo sapiens also had some very strange to us uh, rituals around death, like keeping skulls in their house of their ancestors and things. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, then art, um, before I run out of time, they're still studying this, but it seems like Neanderthals had some art, not the cave art that we talked about like uh, earlier on in this chat, but nevertheless, there's evidence that they used pigments and colors and that they were perhaps making jewelry of some kind. There's also some evidence of arranging of kind of a circle, like a Stonehenge type of thing made out of uh, stalag stalactites from a, from a cave. So that's, um, you know, all sort of evidence that the Neanderthals had some form of art. There's also some bones with some scratching, so it's either maybe a counting system even, or some sort of decoration. So I thought that was real cool. So I'm kind of out of time, but I just wanted to close here with a quote. I just think this is such a cool quote and very beautiful. It's to put our minds, this is at the very end of the book, put us back into time and to meet one of our distant relatives, um, uh, distant Neanderthal relatives. And the quote is, it says, shift back in time to the Pleistocene. Pleistocene. Close your eyes and pick a world, a grassy plain under cool winter sun, a warm forest track, soft loam underfoot, or a now sunken rocky coast. Gulls cries, gulls cries, salting the air. Now listen, step forward, she's here. When you are close enough, Press the skin of your palm against hers. Feel her heat. The same blood runs under the surface of your skin. Take a breath for courage. Raise your chin and look into her eyes. Be careful because your knees will weaken. Tears will come to your eyes and you will be filled with an overwhelming urge to sob. This is because you are human. Neanderthal, human, kindred. So beautiful. So cool. You know, uh, that ending there was uh, really kind of an emotional ending after reading this work of nonfiction and getting to know a bit about the Neanderthals. Just a, 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 an just a delight to read this book. I, I really did learn a lot as well, and I think I have a better understanding about these uh, distant relatives of ours in our early, early history. Okay, I'll leave the chat at that. My next chat is going to be The Great Hunt, book two of the Wheel of Time series by Robert Jordan. Until next time, take care. Bye.